This is Fit to Succeed in partnership with NordicFitnessEducation.com with host Ben Pratt. But we're also the sort of jack of all trades industry where we're expected to know a lot of things in a lot of different areas. So the gap between what we are expected to know and what we do know can be quite large. And then we try and fill that sometimes with substandard information. So. Welcome to this, the final episode of the Fit to Succeed show in season three. Well, actually, it's going to be a two-part episode because there was so much great content to discuss with our guests. We have two guests on today's show, both experts in their fields. They both have doctorate degrees, and they are both working actively in the health and fitness industries. First of all, we have Dr. Alex De Leon. He's an internationally accredited personal trainer and a health and exercise specialist. He has a PhD in the field of sport and exercise science from the University of Birmingham and a master's degree in science in sport and exercise psychology from the University of Loughborough. Alex's research has explored the role of fitness professionals in public health with a particular focus on the knowledge, skills and qualities required of personal trainers. Our second guest is Dr. Dan Jolly. He is the course coordinator for fitness at South Metropolitan TAF in Perth. Dan completed his PhD in educational psychology at Curtin University with a master's in science in exercise physiology from the University of Western Australia. In addition to his experience as a personal trainer, Dan has worked as a strength and conditioning coach in several sports, including cricket, Aussie rules football, and American football. In today's episode, we will be engaging in some fascinating subjects around both of these experts' research fields in terms of critical thinking, in terms of helping the fitness profession upgrade to be able to manage modern public health needs. So let's get straight to the show with Dr. Dan and Dr. Alex. And welcome to this episode of the Fit to Succeed show. We have with us in the studio two fantastic guests. We have Dr. Dan Jolly and Dr. Alex DeLeon. Welcome to the show, gents. Thank you, Ben. Good to see you. Excellent. It's great to have you with us today. Now, we uh, have invited both of you on the show because we feel that you guys have really done some great research and you're in a unique position in that it's quite rare, perhaps, in the fitness industry to have two individuals who are both still, I suppose, consider themselves as personal trainers, fitness trainers, but actually have taken their research all the way up to a PhD level. That's perhaps a rarity in, uh, in the fitness world where most people have done vocational level qualifications. And so we wanted to bring you both together because you've done some unique research. And today, uh, you know, I think what you've got to share and the information you have to unfold to us will be a fascinating discussion for, for our listeners and our, our audience. So what I'd like to do is just to perhaps introduce the two of you a little bit and give you the opportunity to, to share some thoughts on your initial research that might help the listener understand you know, where this sort of discussion is going. And, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open up to a more free-flowing sort of interactive uh, discussion around a, a number of topics. So perhaps, Dr. Dan, if I can start with you, if that's okay. Uh, the first question I'd, I'd like you to unpick a little for us is, in your research, you talk quite a lot about the subject of confirmation bias and then the developing misconceptions of information that can happen very easily uh, for fitness trainers. And that, that was a very central part of your research. I wonder if you can define these terms for our listeners and perhaps then explain how these things commonly impact on our modern fitness uh, industry. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. Um, when we're talking about a misconception, um, it's a little bit different to how we usually think about knowledge. I think the, the layman's way of thinking about knowledge is you either know something or you don't. Um, so you either have knowledge or you have a gap in that knowledge. And then we can learn something and we can uh, fill that gap or we can improve that knowledge. Um, now, that's not entirely correct because our, um, our gaps in knowledge are not just empty space. Sometimes those gaps in knowledge are filled by incorrect knowledge. And sometimes that incorrect knowledge is something we hold quite dear. So it can actually be quite hard to um, correct someone's knowledge. I'm, I'm sure everyone can think of a situation where you've had to try and do this, um, whether it's talking politics or religion or nutrition with someone that you know. Uh, oh, dangerous topics. <laughs> <laughs> Very dangerous topics. So you're unlikely to change their mind and you're unlikely to change their mind because um, it, assuming they're wrong and you're not, 
uh, you're unlikely to change their mind because they've got something that fills uh, the place of that lack of knowledge. Like they've got a they've got a, a error in their knowledge, and that error in their knowledge is going to resist correction. And in the cases we've identified there, it can resist correction for decades. So that's what we call a misconception, an error in knowledge that will resist attempts to correct it. Um, and in in our sort of area, I think that's that's commonly around nutrition. Um, why that happens is where confirmation bias can fit. So um, we rely on a whole bunch of uh, mental shortcuts when we uh, process information and when we decide whether we're going to accept it or not and how much we're going to trust it. And usually we're going to form our opinions based on the knowledge that come first. So whatever we're exposed to really on in our journey, in this case, our fitness journey, our nutrition journey, whatever it is, we're learning new stuff. We really really latch on to that stuff that we came across first. So we tend to interpret everything else through that prism. So subsequent information is interpreted based on how well it agrees with what we've decided is correct early on. Uh, and then if it agrees, well, we're more likely to accept that information and say, hey, we found this, this new piece of information that's really great. If we, if we find it disagrees, we look for reasons to reject it. Um, it might be we start to we start to decide that the source isn't trustworthy or there's a bad piece of research or that's not that person's not a good trainer. Um, so we diminish the importance of that information. So that's what confirmation bias is. We accept the information we like, we reject the information we don't. So the misconception can actually strengthen um, and over time um, can become you know, much, much harder to correct because we've only ever seen information that tells us that we're right. Mm. Um, in mm. fitness, obviously, we can see how that's a problem when if you're a member of the public or you're a trainer and you've got uh, an incorrect belief and that belief is reinforced over years and years and years, uh, from a professional perspective, we could end up maybe not getting our clients the best result they're after or maybe even hurting them as a worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. And I think that I've often taught this as, as I've worked in education that what I typically see with clients is that they like to almost justify why they've made the choices they have so they can continue to make it. And that may also be present in trainers, that trainers have learned certain information and then they find a way to justify against any other possible evidence that they should continue to act that way because they don't, maybe I, I could be wrong here. It seems that they don't want to admit that they might've been wrong or that they may have gone down a path that was less effective. Is that kind of what you're getting back with those two subjects? Yeah, that's the end result of it. So when someone's invested that much time and energy into believing a certain thing, as a result of that, um, when they're challenged, yeah, they're going to be quite evasive about it. And mm. I'd say they, I, I include myself as well, but we all have this in different topics to different extents. Um, so, yeah, they will, they, we've usually made up our mind quite early and quite quickly. Um all the talking and the thinking that we do after that is usually justifying why we've made our decision. We've actually raised a, yeah, a really good point. I, I probably couldn't explain it any better than you did. So yeah, that's exactly right. So how do you think this has impacted the way our industry currently runs? You know, is, for example, do you see pervasive myths that just continue and continue? Is, is that one of the challenges of misconceptions and confirmation bias? Uh, yeah, it is. It's not um, exclusive to the fitness industry. It's it's all walks of life and all industries. So some of the stuff that um, I found in my research, which we'll get to a bit later, is is not any different to any other industries. Um, but yes, there are some misconceptions that will keep going over extremely long periods of time. Um, I like to use the the idea of spot reduction as uh, as a myth or a misconception that we can talk about because it's still quite common in the general public. But mm. it's on that most personal trainers don't accept anymore. So I can talk about it freely without upsetting anyone. So that's great. <laughs> but that's been around since, I want to say the 1890s. I've actually tried to look for the origin of it. And wow. I went to, a, um, to a, a, an exercise instruction textbook from 1893, I think, yeah, that was talking about that for the first time. And it's still around. So here we are 130 years later, um, and it's a misconception we still have to correct. 
Well, I can't believe it's been around that long. That's absolutely amazing. Fantastic. Okay, now uh, perhaps just switch gears a little bit. And another thing you identified in your research, Dr. Dan, was that um, the level of professional experience that a trainer might have doesn't necessarily directly correlate or, or link to the levels of exercise knowledge that, that an individual or a trainer might actually have. And you've also identified that, that individuals uh, who work in fitness tend to overestimate you know, the, their own exercise knowledge. They have you know, quite a high level of confidence in their exercise knowledge. What's the concerns uh, of these types of ob- observations with regards to fitness practice? Yeah, well, the concerns here are, again, the um, the safety of the clients, first and foremost. So, um, again, neither of these phenomena are unique to fitness. Um, It's been seen like every industry will have the same thing, this this level of overconfidence. Um, And we also see in every other industry, um, at least that I could find research on, this, um, this disconnect between how experienced we are in terms of years of service and how knowledgeable we are. Now, fitness is um, an area where knowledge is not necessarily the hallmark of a great trainer. A lot of those practical skills are. And um, to sort of stop any criticism later, I think it's, um, or from anyone watching, I think it's important to say that um, the the practical skills of personal trainers are absolutely invaluable and in no way relate to to what they know. Uh, But... um, we're an industry where levels of education are generally relatively low. And this is something that Alex will probably talk about more later. Um, so there are large gaps in our knowledge. But we're also a sort of jack of all trades industry where we're, we're expected to know a lot of things in a lot of different areas. So the gap between what we are expected to know and what we do know can be quite large. And then we try and fill that sometimes with substandard information. So the potential harm for the clients is something that really concerns me. Yeah, I can, I can understand that for sure. And what, I'd just like to get into that detail just a little bit more because, you know, in, in many industries, people are rewarded or paid as a result of increased in sp- experience. You know, the, the assumption, therefore, is that as someone becomes more experienced, they are better at their job. So are, are you sort of saying that so a trainer, a fitness trainer who has more experience may not necessarily be better at their job or just that their own theoretical knowledge has not increased. What exactly did your research uncover? Well, look, it, it could be both. So I only looked at knowledge. So I didn't look at any of those practical skills at all um, because, you know, it's hard to assess that in a, in a quantitative way and, um, you know, with that sort of research. So, um, but you're right, um, we do often reward length of service or um, length of experience, but Look, if you've been doing a terrible job for 20 years, that's not going to make you any better at it. It's only going to make you better at doing that terrible job. So, um, yeah, that's you can see why that disconnect is there, but I can also see why that's really confronting for people who have been in a job for 15 or 20 years and that might be a really sort of key aspect of their, of their identity um, and something they put a lot of pride in, particularly in quite a transient industry like fitness. Um, but... I think it's important that we don't we don't hold on to that. That's not the that shouldn't be the focus of our um, of our pride. It should be about the quality of the service we perform um, within. You know, even if our knowledge is extremely limited, the service we provide within that knowledge um, could be exceptional, um, and that could definitely improve your practice if you're exposed to good mentors or you know do good professional development. But there's yeah, there's no guarantee. So. There's always individuals who will be the exception to the rule, but the rule is that, um, yeah, we don't see a lot of benefit from it. Mm. I think, uh, you know, it, you reminded me there that quite often in people's CVs or, or you know, even in their bios, it, we do tend to kind of put out there how long we've done a particular job as some kind of, like you almost said, it's a, it's a point of pride. You know, I've done 10 years or 20 years at this job, so therefore I must be brilliant at it. Uh, whereas I, I really appreciated that second point you added in there was really the quality of the service. Uh, and the, the skill that we are able to deliver that service really should be the thing that matters most. Uh, you know, if someone's only been in the industry a couple of years, but is delivering a very high standard of, of service, why should that be of any greater value than someone who's been 20 years and is delivering the equal standard of service? Exactly right. Yeah. And I, I fall into the same trap too. And I think it could also go the other way. Just because someone has a higher level qualification doesn't make them great at those practical skills. So 
we need to recognise and, and acknowledge those skills, um, yeah, regardless of experience or qualification. I think. Great stuff. I really appreciate that, and I think that's that's opened a you know a, a nice avenue of information to help the, uh, the the audience understand kind of where some of your initial research has been. And at this point, I'd like to bring in Dr. Alex. Hi, Alex. If we can bring you into this discussion now, yeah. and um, what, what I'd like to do is kind of begin to get into your research because you kind of touched on in your research on some slightly different areas, and we'll find later on that there is some crossover between what you uh, and Dan have been doing. So, so first of all, perhaps if if you wouldn't mind. Alex, could you uh, just uh, work through that in your research, you refer to fitness professionals uh, as an important, complex and undervalued health related occupational group, which is kind of a mouthful to say, yeah. right? Could you just clarify what that means and expand why you think that this is so? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a lot in that, a lot in that sentence. So, um, so my research looked at the role of fitness professionals in people's health and well-being. And within that, I focused on fitness instructors and personal trainers mainly. And then, so as a society, we're facing uh, public health challenges, which have become widespread. We've got the more immediate challenges that we're facing at the moment, and also longer term challenges. So things like inactivity, um, obesity, um, mental ill health, and also um, unhealthy um, nutritional behaviours. Uh, so as a society, we have these, these health challenges. And within that, we also have, or alongside this, we also have a development of a global fitness industry. So the fitness industry has grown, has become very widespread. So in Europe, for example, the fitness industry has over 64 million consumers. So we have this really popular, popular and engaged industry. So we have the health challenges on one hand and a really growth fitness industry on the other hand. So, mm -hmm. uh, and what my research looked at is the role that um, fitness professionals have within that because obviously um, personal trainers and fitness instructors develop um, close relationships with clients and they have the opportunity to help people to really improve their health and well-being and at the same time it looked at some of the expectations that you have on fitness professionals and um, often what we find is that the expectations as Dan said earlier like can be quite high on on um, fitness instructors and personal trainers and at the same time within our within the fitness industry, partly because it's grown so fast and because it's still a young industry, but there are lots of issues. So things such as the education, which doesn't match up to the um, reality of the job, um, a lot of um, initial education, which is too short, general issues around where the scope of practice is for a personal trainer, what kind of role the personal trainer should be playing in people's um, health and well-being. Um, and some of the, we look across the sector, some of the job roles and career development pathways in the industry. Uh, but I think it's important to say that how much of an opportunity there is for the fitness community and for fitness professionals to play, to really help tackle some of those health challenges uh, that we're facing now as a society. And something that I've been really keen to do as a researcher um, and also as a practitioner is to try and do the best I can to raise the standard of education and to try and, and practice and to try and and really help people to improve their health and well-being through working in fitness. I think that's really fascinating what you said, because th there's kind of three distinct groups that I can see here. We've got, first of all, the educational establishment uh, for fitness education and the level of education that they are required to disseminate to the student. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the student who becomes the trainer and then their, uh, their needs to, uh, to fulfill certain roles for their employers or if they're self-employed for their own business. And then, of course, you've got, as you've kind of alluded to there, the needs of the actual client or members and, and what their current health challenges are, which, uh, you know, as we know, health in our modern times continues to become a, a, an increasing problem. Uh, it's, it kind of sounds like what you're saying is that those three areas aren't gelling together as well as perhaps they should. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I think certainly what we see is that I think there's a gap between what the expectations are and practice of fitness professionals are and then the reality of what we're able to deliver and that's where the issues and also the opportunities are so when we look at for example the people who because so many people are using um, the services of fitness professionals that they can often have quite complex needs in terms of what they're looking for mm -hmm. and so I feel that there's there is at the moment a little bit too much of a gap so how the big question is how do we bridge the gap between what the employers are looking for what the clients are looking for um, and in, in institutions as well to then play a better role in improving health and well-being and that's something which everyone has a role in really it's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's more than the practitioners it's more than the businesses 
so when we look at fitness it's often very much like quite an individual thing so it comes down to where the, what the individual personal trainer wants to do how they want to market themselves where which kind of people they're targeting or the business and um, so it's a very much individual but also at the same time it has a very important role in people's health absolutely now as we talked there you, you mentioned that that personal trainers are expected to fill these kind of complex health related roles in the workplace now when I kind of look at that and I think about that, interestingly, some of those roles kind of happen because the workplace requires it, not necessarily because the trainer thought that's where they wanted to go. They just wanted a job and then their employer kind of pushed them into managing certain health needs because they have members with those needs. Uh, but if formal education isn't meeting those needs, you know, this does raise important questions around a, a pr- professional scope of practice. And you know, h- how, do, how do we protect that scope of practice so that uh, you know, th- the employment needs of a trainer are not kind of pushed upon them beyond what it is they're qualified to do? Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, when you look at the research evidence and you look at um, what kind of expectations personal trainers face as, as Dan said earlier like the, the expectations are very broad and they cover lots of different areas so for example you've got exercises one like in a fitness context perhaps a personal trainer wants to work in fitness and they're passionate about lifting weights or working in the gym but then actually what they find is they go into the fitness industry and people the kind of challenges that they're facing in terms of clients can be more complex than perhaps they'd anticipated. So it covers things like when you're looking at something like um, weight loss is quite common in the fitness industry. So within that, you've got exercise and physical activity is going to be one part of it, but then you've got obviously nutrition is going to be hugely important from an energy balance point of view. And if someone's looking at weight, you're also looking at what other factors are going to be at play there. So something such as um, mindset or psychology, um, lifestyle, sleep. So what, what the, the, the in order to be effective it needs the role of a personal trainer really probably needs to go beyond simply exercise and that's it, and where they initially started in terms of where they look in terms of the, the fitness exercises in the gym it's much more holistic and we need as a trainer they need to be aware of where they're what it is that they're providing but also how we can provide the best possible service within the knowledge and the scope of practice that we're able to and mm-hmm. um, all, all of this comes partly of I said before, like the the success of the fitness industry in terms of how we've been able to create engaging experiences for people. And so it's a question of how do we do the best we can to engage the most people and to help them the most we can when it comes to them achieving the goals that they're they're setting out to do. Excellent. Thank you. I think as we've kind of opened up both of those avenues, hopefully the, the listeners can see where we're trying to go with this conversation. We've got on one side this this uh, ongoing misconceptions, perhaps people not developing their knowledge the way that that the industry kind of needs them to. And then on the other side, you know, there is this real need with employers, with members, with clients to to deliver more than just the exercise needs, as you said. And so I think this, this lends well to a really interesting discussion as we move forward. Okay, so let's start this whole discussion now. I, 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 with a bit more open discussion between the two of you, drawing upon your your research and interests. And I wanted to ask the question because, you know, I come from a, an education world where we educate trainers and teach them uh, what the, the skills and the knowledge that they need to have. And one of the things that was interesting in the research that both of you have kind of touched upon is this idea that trainers sometimes may act or sometimes intend to act in opposition to the knowledge that they were formally taught within their own education. Um, is this likely to be, do you think, a deliberate diversion away from formal education? Or you know, what factors could be at play that a trainer would not follow the things that they were taught? Open to either of you on, on that front. Perhaps, Dan, if we start with you, and then Alex, you can contribute, because I know you did some research on this too. Yep, absolutely. In fact, Alex, there's a, there's a little bit from your paper that I'd love you to talk about at some point. I think you know the, the bit I'm talking about here. Um, the, uh, what I find really interesting about that is I don't think it's a I don't think it's an intent to um, reject knowledge because I think they've they've made a they've made a decision about that knowledge based on the um, you know based on how it's been agreeing with their with their prior beliefs. So we talked about the, that sort of confirmation bias earlier. So in the mind of the trainer, it's not it's not a conscious choice to reject new information. It's a it's a decision that well I'm I'm pretty smart and I know what I'm doing and. I know more than this instructor, so you know I'm just going to go and do my thing. Um, 
and they're probably egged on by you know the people that already agree with them. So um, it's certainly not um, a trainer sort of meaning to reject knowledge, but rather the choice they're making to do something better. Um, and it's you know it's everywhere, and it's yeah again that's something that's going to be unavoidable. Um, and sometimes there are going to be some valid criticisms about the quality of the training as well. Um, I know the, the, the vocational training um, industry in Australia um, has a couple of weaknesses as far as that's concerned. And that's something that I've identified as well. Um, but yeah, I do find it, I find it fascinating that somebody would, um, would really actually consciously and openly reject information like that. And actually an experience with that was one of the, um, was, one of the motivations for me to start a PhD, but um, I know that Alex's paper, first paper, I think had um, had a really good point about that. Could, I'd love to hear you talk about it. Yeah. So the participants that I interviewed for that, the paper you're referring to, that there was a key, a really interesting point that they made that they, when they talked about passing, so when it comes to formal qualifications in an industry, like they talked about when they were, when they were doing their initial um, qualifications, it's almost like a driving test. So they viewed it as a way of like trying to get through the test and to pass the exams. And then with the view of then working in the fitness industry where they would actually learn how to then work in their, in their working roles. And then it was almost a sense of like, they get in the industry and then they'll learn personal trainers will then learn on the job as well. And actually it was reflected in the way in which they they saw, they saw their education, which was quite technical about lifting, but then that lifting and various different things. But then once you start working in the fitness environment, you realize there's actually a lot more to it and yet there are other pressures that are perhaps different from what you were facing during your formal training education and so within when we look at fitness environments there are going to be there's likely to be pressures on um, making sales for example developing a client base sometimes the scope, scope of practice is perhaps not entirely understood by um personal trainers but i'm not sure it's actually clear in the first place i think the scope of practice of personal trainers is quite broad about where you go into different um, areas and also it's one thing saying something in theory when you're doing your initial qualification oh this is this is where where we should be sticking within our boundaries but then it's something very different when you've got a client in front of you who is expecting you to to help them in and manage their lifestyles and to some extent it comes down to the personal trainer and you have to make a decision about where you're, how you're going to manage those different expectations, the expectations of your employer, of yourself, of the client, and ultimately make a decision about how best to serve, um, to serve those client needs. I think, I think you've raised a really great point. Perhaps we could all sort of uh, contribute here, but I would like to share an, an example, I think, in this scenario, which is when I first started as a, as a trainer, uh, I think my, uh, I think it was my third job, but it was still within just a few years of me getting into the industry. Uh, I was in the middle of a sports science degree. My only qualifications formally uh, for for fitness w- was a very basic one week long course. You know, this was this was just at the point that the register of exercise professional system was starting to get into play in in, in sort of two thousand. And because I was the only one in the in the team at the time who had who was in the middle of a degree, any difficult clients were sent my way that, that somehow I would always know how to deal with them. And I can remember being sent clients to, to work with who had, you know, major issues with joints and arthritis, back pain, things like that, which were far outside the, the, anything I'd been taught in, in my, uh, in my vocational qualifications at the time. And certainly wasn't anything we were really dealing with in a big way um, in, in terms of my degree at that stage. So there was a pressure from the employer to deal and serve and help these people, but it was it was making me, you know, as a young, uh, perhaps not brave enough to say I really shouldn't be doing this. Uh, it was making me having to to manage people who really should have been referred. Uh, you know, do you think that that sort of scenario is going on a lot? Uh, do you have you found that in, in your research? Well, that's not something I looked at specifically. That sort of experience about that, but yeah, I like anecdotally from my own industry experiences and the people I talk to. Yeah, I think it does. Um, and I think part of the issue is, um, as you, I think um, you both correctly identified, like the professionalization of the fitness industry is something that's a fairly recent thing. So um, Ben, you mentioned the last 20 years, and I think it's a similar sort of time frame in, in Australia, and we have a similar system of registration now. But mm. uh, there's, 
what we really need to see, I think, is a, is a cultural change in terms of how, um, and well, we're in the middle of that change, about how we, um, how we treat knowledge and how we treat expertise and, and how we treat our services. And so rather than trying to be that jack of all trades, which is the position you found yourself in for those really high risk clients, like um, in that situation, you were, I don't think you probably had anyone modeling um, a better behavior. You know? So there was nobody you could look up to saying, oh, I'm not the best person to do that for you, but this person is, or actually that's outside my scope of practice. You need to be talking with this professional instead. You know, so yeah. I mean, I would, I would have thought, to be honest, even at that point, Dan, I would have thought that that you know, like thinking back, I, I don't even think the term scope of practice was probably even in my vocabulary back then. You know, I was I, I was sort of like 19, 20 years old. It probably wasn't even my, my vocabulary. So to be aware of staying within the the guard rails of the scope of practice, you know, it was 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 probably something that still hadn't really fully settled with me. So I, I understand where you're at for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's something that's, um, you know, absolutely no blame for anyone who, you know, doesn't know what they don't know in that situation. Like it's only until you've had more exposure or until you've grown up in the modern industry where I know with my students, at least scope of practice is something that, that they can't get me to shut up about. And I think they, wish they could. So they, they don't have that same excuse and they don't have that same problem. So hopefully they're starting their practice in their first year or two as a trainer from a better place. Alex, do you have anything to say on that point? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's interesting because it actually your experiences sort of reflect on how fast or how well the industry has grown in some ways about the fact we are having scopes of practice, the fact we are more, um, more, more professionalised in some ways than we first started off being. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to scopes of practice, I think we need to look at the fitness industry as something which is quite an entrepreneurial industry, quite an individual um, industry so it's quite different to for example in in the UK we have the health service NHS and so within that kind of service like referral is, to other practitioners is much easier so if you're a, a general practitioner they can refer to um, other other uh, people or medical professionals much easier than we can in fitness in fitness there is an expectation that you're going to be facing you're going to be able to deal with the clients that um, come to you and that's what's found in my research as well but I think that what we're also seeing is organizations can find ways to help practitioners to stay within that scope of practice. And so, and the, the industry is evolving around that. So for example, like the health club I work at, they have a way of one way in which we found of helping trainers stay within the scopes of practice to make the most of their expertise is to have um, trainers who are specializes in specialized in different areas. So to, the way in which management build a team is really important. And the cult, as Dan said, like the culture that's created, within that environment. So as an example, in our club, we have experts in female fitness, experts in um, hypertrophy, experts in boxing, for example. So recently I, I, a client came to me, wanted um, personal training, but based on boxing. No, I don't do boxing. I do uh, more, I work more with busy city professionals, holistic health and wellbeing, that side of it. And so when, if you look across a club and if the club has a, a balance of different ex- different specialisms it's easier for each of those people within the club to stay within their scope of practice whereas if we look at perhaps in my research what we found from a phd point of view was that clubs can be just a collection of individuals who are perceived to be in competition with one another and they're then more fighting for clients they're going to try and take on um, the clients in front of them so a lot of it comes around to the within the club health club or gym environment the way in which the team is built and whether there is a culture of um, referral. And the other, the other point on that is whether, who, how, um, the, well, what the links are like with other um, health professionals. So for example, if a personal trainer has someone who they perceive to be outside of their scope of practice in terms of, for example, whether it's a medical condition, whether it's high blood pressure or um, osteoporosis or something, they don't feel that they're capable of delivering would they have the means and systems to refer to other people? And a lot of it comes down to the individual personal trainer about whether they're going to set up um, a system of referral. And so, for example, as a personal trainer, I've set up a system of referral. If I have someone who I feel is wants nutrition advice, which I'm not able to provide, I work with nutritionists. I, if I have someone who has a back issue that I'm not able to and not don't feel comfortable providing I have a um, an osteopath I work with and a physio, um, but it takes time. And you also need the respect from the 
from both sides as well. So it can't just be a one-way system of personal trainers referring to um, osteos or referring to physios because then potentially you risk losing your clients. And so there needs to be a respect amongst from the other way as well, from the, from the medical professionals. And hopefully we can get into ways in which um, or we can discuss ways in which that can be done more effectively because I certainly have ex- I've got experience of working quite effectively with health and medical professionals and I think it can be done. I think a lot of it comes from um, education, having the link set up as well. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I, I think there's there's, a, there's an interesting little angle we could sort of go into here before we sort of go down that that road, if if I'm right. And now you've talked we've talked a little bit there about the employers creating this pressure and this need to be able to refer. But 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 as I look at that, uh, something that I've seen and come across, and it kind of links the two ideas that we're talking about here together, and that is that trainers may read a book as part of their ongoing learning. They haven't taken a course. Maybe that book's about stress, for example, and now they believe because they have a bit more knowledge that they can now service and, and offer the, the necessary support to somebody who comes with them who's struggling with stress. And so maybe they use a little assessment that's in the book. They assess their client. Oh, you're, you're overly stressed. Now let me give you these supporting mechanisms. So, you know, is that, uh, just, is, is that moving outside of scope of practice? Is that a misconception that they've got because they gained a bit of knowledge and now they think they're good enough? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on something like that that definitely happens an, an awful lot in the fitness industry? Well, in that case, I, I would suggest it's, it's incomplete knowledge rather than an error in knowledge. But that could, that could definitely lead to a misconception. So if that incomplete knowledge then informs their practice and they get, um, like they might get a bit of feedback from the, from the client in terms of this worked well and this didn't, or um, you, know, you get these little anecdotes and that changes the way you process the information. Like you start to, um, you start to rely more on, on one thing than another thing and that could then develop into a misconception after that absolutely um i think alex raised the point earlier about how like the isolation of a personal trainer how you're really operating in a silo like of one and it's 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 you know maybe just you and you you feel the people around you are competitors and you don't have a referral network yet and you don't have a mentor to help you build one so you don't want to refer your clients away so i can definitely understand that pressure to do that and try and be everything to everyone um, and that could absolutely lead to those misconceptions developing. Um, ideally, um, that trainer in that example, I think reading that, that book on stress might go, oh, well, that's interesting, but I don't know how to apply it yet, or I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if this is quite right or who wrote it or, you know, ask a bunch of questions and maybe talk to someone who, who can help, you know, like um, seeking out somebody to answer some of those questions for them. So. Yeah, again, modeling that sort of behavior or changing the way we think about expertise and knowledge, I think would um, would go a long way towards preventing some of those errors down the track. Mm-hmm. Alex, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think it's an interesting example because it, what it shows, it's, it's quite a typical example. It, it shows that the personal trainer facing a client who's obviously facing an issue, so it's around stress, and then the personal trainer's taking the decision to upskill. So they're trying to find a way of helping the, the client that they're encountering. And that's something that, I've certainly found in my research and I've found working in the fitness industry for a long period of time as well, is how personal trainers do want, they, like, we, a lot of personal trainers want to help the clients that they're working with. And it's, mm-hmm. they will, will go and upskill because they'll go and look at, read books on, for example, stress or psychology. Um, and then, but then the, the challenge is how does that, how do you optimize that learning? How do we make the learning the most effective for the challenges that they're facing? And it, a lot of it down, comes down to context um, when it comes to the per- a decision that the, the personal trainer makes. And then, so something that, um, something that I found in my, re- something I'd say from the research point of view is that when we look at the fitness industry, a lot of it, a lot of the education is quite technical training, um, like learn this, do that. But then when you look at something like um, education, it's an education I would say is broader. And so it covers things like critical thinking skills, problem solving, analytical skills and so if we think about the case of a, a personal trainer upskilling to to encounter an issue with psychology that's the importance of having a really good quality of education to understand to reflect on where their role um where the role could be to help the client and as, as dan said like having a, a network of people around as a personal trainer if you have a network of people around you um who are supportive a mentor or 
um, whoever happens to be, that can be very helpful for helping to translate the information um, to your client. Um, obviously, other things you can do. There's so many different ways as a personal trainer that you can upskill with. It's CPD courses, books, um, information available um, on the internet. And obviously, some of the sources are going to be more or, or um, less reliable. But ultimately, as a practitioner, you're making the decision about what is going to be most beneficial to your client within a scope of practice. And I think it's just really important to understand that it's not it's not a clear cut black and white thing. It's a, it's a decision that's made based on judgment. And that's why the initial training is so important. And it's why working together as a professional community is so important as well. I wonder, I wonder at this point, if we could, uh, if we could get a, a thought in there, because we're talking quite heavily now about scope of practice. And, I, and I'm wondering, you know, how do we define what is appropriate professional? Now, I'm going to add that word in professional scope of practice, because, you know, let's say, you know, I, I was a, a typically trained personal trainer, I've got my, my certification under my belt, but that certification doesn't cover, you know, the ability to deal with somebody who's got arthritis, but I've read up a bit about it. You know, I've, I've learned about it online. I don't have any formal qualification uh, to, to back that up yet as a self-employed trainer, I have an insurance, uh, you know, contract that I have to honor and make sure that I stay within my scope of practice so that I'm insured. If something goes wrong in the, because of the guidance I've given that client, even though I've upskilled by reading stuff, you know, where do I now stand? You know, can you kind of see the dilemma I'm trying to create here? Yeah, can I can I ask a question, guys? Um, is um, in your respective countries, do, does everyone have a formalized scope of practice from a, from a peak body? Yeah, they do in Ireland yeah. and they yeah, do in yeah. the UK. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so in that case, like it's it's already defined for us, um, which I think um, not every trainer is going to be aware of. Um, because that sort of registration scheme is voluntary and still needs to sort of grow in acceptance. But um, the nice thing about the um, about the Australian scope of practice is it covers that point explicitly, and it says that any professional development you do um, does not extend your scope of practice. So um, you can you can become more knowledgeable within that scope, and you can become more confident dealing with those sort of low to medium risk clients. Um, but your scope of practice doesn't extend until you gain more formal qualifications. So what would be an example then, Dan, of, of a qualification that would extend a, a trainer's scope of practice in Australia? Right. So that would mean like going up the, you know, going up the level. So I think, um, I think in Europe and Australia, we, we both work from a qualifications framework where uh, personal training would be about a level three or four. Yep. Um, so, um, you know, a, a bachelor's degree would be the obvious one people would think about, but even like, uh, you know, if there's a diploma or associate diploma or something like that that's offered, that would be an example of a qualification that could be useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Alex, do you have anything to say on that particular point or on scope of practice? Yeah, I think it's easy to, to say in theory that look at the scope of practice and then stick within it. But then when actually what I found in my research is that the and and i found in practice it's it's very difficult to stay within those rigid boundaries of of where that scope of practice is um and that's something that the the fitness professionals that i interviewed found as well like they might they may well know that they're moving slightly beyond what their scope of practice is but at the same time they've got the expectations of the employers you've got the expectations of um the client you've got the expectations of lots of things you the, you risk if you stay as a personal trainer within what I found from a research point of view is that if they stick rigidly within their scope of practice all the time, it, they risk not having enough clients to build their business effectively because they constantly end up referring out. And, and then it, there's an interesting question of ethics. So the, the, eth the ethics, the ethical judgments that a personal trainer needs to make, I think we need to be re I think it's something that as an industry could draw more attention to and as educators we could draw more attention to is as a personal trainer you're going to make may need, maybe need to make a judgment so one of the case study um personal trainers i did has a family has children he has a client comes to him who maybe extends slightly beyond where his scope of practice is now what does he do does he turn that client away and say well look you're not in my scope of practice and then does he and he's, so he's kind of weighing up well do i earn the money from my role do I take on the client do I not take on the client and it's interesting what I find interesting looking at the research which is done in Australia is how much or how to the extent to which 
personal trainers exceed their scope of practice around. So the paper that I'm sure Dan has read around nutrition. So was it 88% of personal trainers exceeded their scope of practice? Um, are you talking about Mark McKean? Mark McKean, or, or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah 88%. Absolutely. So that's like, that suggests something's wrong there, right? That suggests there's an issue there. And I don't think we can say that the issue is entirely on the personal trainers, because I think when we look at an industry, we've got to ask the question about why that happens and what, how can we support it, I think, is, is, is important. And because if, if you, so I had actually, so as a personal trainer, going, going, I did my PhD and then worked practically as a personal trainer. And something I'd made a conscious decision, I'd read the research on um, nutrition I made a conscious decision, okay, well, I don't want to go too much into nutrition because I know that's something that personal trainers are criticized for. So if the client came to me, I'll say, well, I'll, this is the kind of advice I'll provide you on nutrition and we'll focus on exercise and fitness training. Now that certainly lost me quite a lot of clients, actually, to be honest, because they wanted um, advice on nutrition and I don't think it was that effective. So I needed to then do a course to upskill on nutrition because that was something that I was lacking. But actually, when you look at the structure of the education system, if personal trainers did that and they upskilled into all the areas for all the clients that they're coming, it would cost them a fortune. So like you're, you're talking in this country, you're talking thousands of pounds, like to deal with, to take on one client that's come to you. Um, and so it, I, I'm not sure it's entirely fair to place the blame on personal trainers if they're taking on clients who maybe sit slightly outside or moving slightly beyond their scope of practice because we need to look at the the board of contacts I and mean, where that sits legally is a different kind of question but i think it's a question about how we can support personal trainers to be the best they can and to we're I mean, not the advantage of operating mean, obviously scopes of practice are hugely hugely important because if you start to move out of what you're offering um, in terms of where the boundaries of your knowledge and your expertise are you do risk causing harm to the client and as trainers as people working in fitness we have a really important role in people's health, well-being, their bodies. You don't want to cause injury. You don't want to cause harm. Um, you want to be helping the person. Mm. And also to ourselves as well. The other important point about scope of practice is when you move out of scope, side of scope of practice, you're risking being sued. You're risking, and there have been court cases taken against personal trainers for moving out of scope of practice. But at the moment, it's largely an individual decision about where you, what you take on um, as a trainer but really when we're talking about all this we're talking about how how can we make the most of a group of people who want to fundamentally help I mean people move into fitness often because they're passionate about fitness and they want to help people right mm -hmm. like, that's, why, that's why I stayed in the industry so long I love I love helping people it's amazing the progress and improvement that people can make so the, what we what, where I think the opportunities lie is to look at how can we match up this group of people who really want to help people to improve their health and well-being, fitness, um, lift better, move better, be happier um, with the expectations of their role. And that's where things like the education and um, having high quality job roles in the fitness industry come in. And yeah. it's, it's also what excites me about the fitness industry as well. Yeah. Dan, do you have something to come in on there? Yeah, yeah, I do. I just wanted to touch base on on that on the referral thing you talked about earlier. So, um, and I think that might be um, something where, we can we can change the way we think about referrals. So I think it's often thought about as you know referral is losing a losing a client, but I think once we build up that professional network, it doesn't have to be. Um, it can be serving a client better. You know, like we can be part of a broader team rather than moving the client on to somebody else and and then oh, well that's someone we're not going to get back. Um, like an example of that is, for example, one of the physios that I. Um, I have referred to a lot um, used to um, he used to really appreciate it when I called to make the appointment for the client so the client complained about something a sore back and something that I, I didn't feel comfortable dealing with so I'd call the physio right then and there and we'd make the appointment and then so I knew they were having an appointment and then when they're in the appointment he'd call me and he'd say right I've got I've got John here and here's the problem and here's what I'm telling him here's how I want you to handle this exercise so it was more of a more of a collaborative approach, mm. um, and obviously there's some trust that needs to be built before a physio is going to, you know, like let you into their to their consulting room like that. Um, but I've had that happen on, on multiple occasions where a physio has been happy for me to join in and be part of that conversation. And then we're not losing the client, like we're we're still operating within our scope of practice. But now we can deal with a higher risk client because we're 
we're supervised essentially. So we're working with a high risk client under guidance of another professional. So we're not exceeding our scope of practice by working with that person, but we're, we're more um, like we can do more. Like we've got permission to do a bit more because we're working with those other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting. I, I, I was very fortunate early in my career to uh, to have the opportunity to do something collaborative like that. I had a, I worked with a girl who had had a pretty severe horse riding accident. She was a county level equestrian um, rider, and uh, she she uh, was uh, referred to me at the end of her initial physio, and she she had a really bad limp. I could still struggle to walk because she'd broken her leg in seven places, you know. Uh, but fortunately, her physio was also a member of the same gym. And so because of that, I saw him often and spoke with him regularly. And then we were able to work together in trying to help her get back to be able to walk and run without this limp, you know? So it was, a, it, you know, even at a young age, I learned the importance of collaboration. And I, I really, you know, echo what Dan has said is that, but, but I also see what Alex is saying in that point, which is a lot of trainers feel like referral is I'm losing a client. They feel like, oh, I have to refer you, but actually there's a commercial business decision I'm trying to make here, which is I need income. And particularly if you're self-employed, you know, a a vast majority of people in Europe are self-employed personal trainers. And when you look at the sort of typical client numbers that people tend to have, every client matters to them. And to refer somebody away, even if it's only temporarily, you know, they might go and see another expert in another field for two or three months and then come back to you. But even that delay sometimes in income can be a real difficult ethical decision. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share via social media. You can also rate the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, then check out our range of online courses at www.nordicfitnesseducation.com. 